A decade ago, pop was an unstoppable force in the charts. As boy bands and girl bands showed a generation how to sing, dance, do denim and slam dunk the funk. But for many idols, the dream came to an abrupt end. We were dropped. We were a product. Now, six former pop heavyweights are reuniting, dusting down their outfits and polishing their dance moves as they prepare for an epic one-off gig. This is literally starting over from scratch. I am going to fight the corner. I'm not a pushover anymore. This is the big reunion. Tonight, three feisty kittens and Pop Poster Boys 911 dish the dirt. Flashback to five years earlier, and two northern lads are taking their first steps towards fame. Myself and Spike used to be on a TV show called The Hitman and Air. It was basically a kind of nightclub with Michaela Strachan and Pete Waterman with the presenters. Another scintillating night, another scintillating game. Unbelievable. All the big artists like E17, whoever was on the bill, we used to dance in between them all. And obviously the generation before me and Spike was uh, Jason Orange from Take That. And when we seen them and how many girls were going for him, we were like, oh, we want a piece of this. Jimmy and Spike were solid dancers, but to complete the pop band, they had to confront the old fashioned notion of drafting in someone who could actually sing. The sooner we get somebody in, the sooner we can get on the road and get some women. You know, that, that's all we were kind of in it for. And their luck was in. Would-be singer Lee Brennan was a fan of the dancing duo and badgered their management for an introduction. I'd seen them a couple of times, like, in my hometown of Carlisle, switching on Christmas lights, and I always thought they were amazing dancers. We met him in, in Burger King in Carlisle. <laughs> and for me, I was meeting two famous guys. Yeah, that's really cool, like. He said himself that he was quite starstruck with the whole situation. The first thing I noticed was they had the jeans tucked into the boots and I thought, twat. Now the trio was complete and a new boy band was unleashed. This is now the beginning of 911. Let's see how far we can take this. We're going to have a number one one day, that is our aim. We're going to work our asses off. Um, and we're going to do Wembley Arena. Undeterred by a lack of interest from major record labels, they took their rough and ready show on the road and built a fan base from scratch. So, yeah, we spent probably a good year and a half, I think, just doing school tours. We were doing about five to six, seven shows a day. There was the excitement and there was the, the buzz because it was just three guys breakdancing and flipping all over the stage. After 18 months of relentless backflipping in school halls across the country, the boys struck gold with a record deal worth three and a half million pounds. There was always girls outside and we couldn't leave our hotels. You just couldn't go anywhere. With a deal in the bag, girls flinging themselves at their feet, 911's journey to superstardom had begun. <laughs> Newly formed and fresh faced Atomic Kitten and 911 were getting a taste of pop stardom and they were loving it. In 1996, 911 released three singles, all of which inched their way into the nether regions of the charts. But it wasn't until they shook their bodies that they hit the big time. So a massive turning point for us was Body Shaking. It was a song that catapulted us to bigger than we could ever imagine. Everywhere we turned up, there's just banners everywhere. You got my body shaking all the time. Body Shaking stormed into the UK charts at number three and kick-started the band's global takeover. We got to Malaysia and no one had told us, like, we'd taken off there. And we just thought we'd be unknown. It was just crazy. We got out of the airport and it was just thousands.
In the end, the, the, the record company brought the army in because it was just ridiculous. They were getting ripped apart, they were pulling our hair, our clothes. They came in, parted everybody, and we just like, ran on this bus and obviously gave us a, an army escort. Police sirens were going everywhere, and we were just thinking, this is ridiculous, it's got to be a wind-up. We said to me, what's going on here? And they were like, oh, you're number one. Like album and single charts, and it just went huge there. I think we finished up 12 times platinum. And in 1999, the lads hit the ballad button and cracked their first UK number one with a little bit more. Uh, lots of people getting crushed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Seven thousand people in here. All for us. Wonder why. Can't be our music. Nine one one had sold a ridiculous ten million records and were heartthrobs worldwide. But like any boy band, there was one important rule. Obviously, our manager always said, "This is your image. You are seen as a, a clean-cut boy band." And he did tell us no girlfriends and all that stuff at the start, which obviously we completely ignored. <laughs> I was just like a walking hormone. We were just up all night with women and drink. Jimmy was naughty. Spike was the naughtiest. He was just an animal. He was just a dirty bastard. There's been many occasions that we've kind of woke up and thinking, I don't know what went on last night. All I know is there's two women in my bed. I don't know who they are, what their names are, but I've just called a taxi for them. While touring the Middle East, Britain's cultural ambassadors flew into strict Muslim country Bahrain and behaved as if they were on holiday in Magaluf. Got smashed at the bar and everybody just jumped in the pool. Everyone naked and everything and the uh, police turned up and was going to arrest us. They were saying you can get ten years for this. It was illegal, you know, you couldn't, uh, you couldn't do that kind of thing. And they ended up just taking us, like guards, to the stage, putting us on stage, getting us off, driving us straight on the tarmac of the airport and just deporting us. While 911 were riding high, Atomic Kitten were playing catch-up, but had a breakthrough with the lofty accolade of supporting 911 on their 1999 tour. What do you think of Atomic Kitten? Too sexy for words to be we like to prank him. I think we got a load of foam one time. We just put loads of foam in their shoes and they wasn't happy. I think on the last night at all, they trashed our changing room and put like, now I want to shit pictures everywhere. <laughs> and I went behind stage and pissed in the trainers. <laughs> With Kerry and the girls just breaking through, for 911, the real madness of life at the top of the pops was in full effect. The boys were jet-setting around the globe, performing, promoting and partying hard. They might have been living the high life, but it was starting to take its toll on the band's dynamic. The first three years, we worked so hard. I think we had ten days off in total in three years. I've actually got a schedule. It's ridiculous. Cardiff, London, Southampton, Sheffield, Slovenia, Austria, Germany, Belgium. Me and I got an earpiece each. We had a guy talking in English to me over here, and she was talking German to us, so we were like, Whoa! Our workload just increased massively. It was 24-7. Switzerland, Germany, London, London, Glasgow, London. This is what it was like day to day. <laughs> wow. Wow. Looking back to how it was, then you was basically in prison. It was ridiculous. You got to the point where you just get into photo shoots and thinking, how are you going to put me in the magazine? I can't even, I can't even knock my eyes. Right, I had half an hour's sleep. I'm wrecked. It's just killing us. We are like, fainting everywhere. We just never stopped. I remember crying and just saying, I can't... I can't cope with it all. While Atomic Kitten was scrapping with each other, 911 were notching up conquests around the world. But for the poster boy of pop, it all changed the night they performed with a bewitching girl band. The bewitched girls they were proper, innocent, nice girls. I think the managers kept them away from us, even though Lee got there in the end. Bewitched supported us in Summer 98 and our arena tour. But I met Lindsay again. It was the Spice Girls concert at Wembley Stadium. And Lindsay was there. That was the first time I thought, 
Well, she's really cute, like. Why didn't I notice her on my tour? <laughs> she's very, like, calm and serene and very elegant, beautiful. And from then on, I thought, this girl's special, definitely. And we, we started seeing each other as much as we could then. It was fun. It was fun getting to know each other and stuff them days. Got engaged and then we, we had an amazing fairy tale wedding. That whole day was just the best day ever. <laughs> so from meeting in like 90, 98, yeah, I mean, 13 years together is a long, long time. And we just mutually decided to separate a year ago. And so hard for both of us that maybe it just had to be done. I still find it tough that we're not together. Um, I mean, I guess if she rang me tomorrow and said, how do you fancy you just getting back together again, I would. She's my wife, I love her, so... But reality says it's probably not gonna happen. Interband relationships like Lee and Lindsay's had tabloids fighting over headlines. But when Kerry Katona started dating Brian McFadden from Westlife, things went off the scale. We 1997. 911 were at the top of their game, but the non stop touring and excessive partying was starting to take its toll. The lads were struggling to cope. The pressures of fame do affect you, and uh, no matter how good the friendship is, eventually it will, uh, the music business will, will take over you. It was just a really low time, I think. Communication between us three was, was zero. It's gonna be a long night. 911 were in turmoil. Tensions within the group were reaching breaking point. Even though you know you have a lead singer for the band, I think I started to kind of think, I wouldn't mind a bit of this. Jimmy was becoming a better vocalist, and I think he was a bit jealous of Lee, and he wanted to be more of a front man. I, I, I probably was resenting him, uh, wanting a bit more of the action, I suppose. We did some promotion out in America in a radio station, and I remember walking out this kind of corridor, and he said something that, that basically I just lost it. He slammed me into this uh, glass door and stuff like, and then I just remember he pinned me up and stuff. And, and it was, it was going to be a, a full-on brawl, and I think Spike jumped in and kind of obviously calmed it down. Jimmy and Lee's relationship hit rock bottom. As well as fighting each other, they were struggling to keep their own demons under control. Lee had beaten cancer twice as a child, but the emotional scars stayed with him. I was really, really poorly. I was a poor little boy and I lost all my hair and kids will be kids, won't you? You, you get called baldy and yeah, I didn't realise how much actually, how deeply it sort of like affected me, like confidence wise and losing my hair for the second time was hit me even like harder than the first time, definitely. So I've always had issues with, yeah, just the way I look. Yeah. On the surface, Lee was Pop's poster boy, but beneath there were dark insecurities. I was being obsessive about the way I looked. I used to look at pictures and I used to say, you look like shit, you look so tired, you look ugly. I just couldn't cope with it. I found the fame side hard. Like, if I was in a restaurant, someone would look at me, I'd start shaking, my stomach would turn, and I just, I hated just being recognised. So I can't see us because I get mobbed so in disguise. I couldn't socialise if the public was there because I was just getting so nervous and felt so awkward being in public that I was becoming more of a recluse near the end. Whilst the others suffered in silence, Jimmy's demise was more public. I think for me personally, I think alcohol played a, a huge role, especially in my kind of probably mood swings and, and dealing with uh, the situations that we had to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. So when we walked into this photo shoot where, you know, they, they basically wanted cheesy smiles at the, at the camera, it was like, I'm not doing it. 
and, and, and I think I did about probably half an hour and I went, listen, bollocks, fuck the lot of you, I'm going. At his worst, a despondent Jimmy was boozing at breakfast. When it came to Edwards, he turned up to SMTV and he couldn't even stand up. <laughs> he was absolutely bladdered. And we're like, going on live TV here, and Jimmy's just a mess. With all three members mentally falling apart, 911 discovered their label had surprising thoughts about the future of the band. When Virgin mentioned the greatest hits to us, straight away in my head I thought, the end of the band. I chatted to Spike about splitting up and and he sort of agreed that it was probably the right time. We knew we'd reached our peak and we were on that kind of little decline and we thought, well, it's best getting out, you know, at the top. There was a packed crowd waiting for us to come and perform three songs and, and we just said to Jimmy, what do you think about, you know, after we've been to Asia doing the tour and stuff, that we just call it a day? Spike and Lee just decided that uh, to drop this massive bombshell and I was, like, completely gobsmacked and probably got wrenched really. You could see it really hit Jimmy. I think I'd actually gone back to my room and usual thing, uh, you know, got the Jack Daniels out. And then we had to go, right, hello Birkenhead, you got my body shaking. Jimmy had no choice, the decision was made and now they had to tell the world. Out the blue, another bombshell was, uh, oh yeah, we, we're gonna announce the split on Chris Moyles. They said, oh, by the way, uh, we want you to announce it. I was like, Thank you very fucking much. <laughs> Obviously, all the fans were all lined up against the front of Radio 1 in tears, and, you know, I was kind of close to tears myself, but I didn't want to show them. Thank you for everything. Thank you for five years of fantastic time in my life. Lee? And, uh, I'm Lee? Lee? Have a normal life. And I think in the end, I just went, right, see you later, I'm off. Jimmy just drove straight off and uh, I'd never seen him for two years and it was weird for me because, you know, from being like 16, me and Jimmy inseparable <laughs> every day of the week, we were just together. For me, it was, it, was an, it was an excuse basically to get the alcohol out and uh, I didn't have to worry about it, didn't have to answer to anybody. Since splitting 12 years ago, 911 have tried to build normal lives away from the spotlight. Lee married bewitched beauty Lindsay, but sadly, Pop's power couple didn't last. After years of struggling with his image in front of the camera, he now finds solace behind the lens as a portrait photographer. Wow. If looks could kill. <laughs> but stepping back into the spotlight brings certain issues to the surface. The two lads are quite well built and stuff, but now I'm going to get some muscles, hopefully. I just think I'll... I'll be the best shape, bodily shape I've ever been, so that's why I'm gonna work, work my ass off to do it. I'm just ready, ready for everything, like. This is heavy, you know, it's not really like, I'm just showing off. Get ready for your sprint, have the deep breath. Get ready, yeah, yeah, drive. Yeah, you've got it, careful on the way back. Well done. Come in, go, 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 drive, drive, drive. Well done, well done, sprint back. Go on. <laughs> they got, look at them, they're not bad, they're coming on. Not bad. Doing good. After a dubious reign as a dancer and hellraiser, 911's Jimmy left his boy band ways behind and is now a house husband, living with his wife and two children in Cambridgeshire. <laughs> Yeah, what's, uh, what's the general feeling with the other guys in terms of the reunion? Yeah, I think everybody's uh, everybody's kind of excited about it. It's just whether the, the body can take it this time. Everybody's been in the gym and working hard and trying to be as fit as you possibly can at 41 years old. Might have to change it, change the style. I'll be a more stand up and sing rather than the uh, old body shaping. Do a Westlife and just sit on stools. Shut. Spike disappeared back to Warrington and describes himself as a budding entrepreneur. He'd left his back-flipping, break-dancing, body-shaking moves behind him until now. I'm worried about my ankle because 
in Tenerife, got very drunk with Sammy and her dad, and he jumped in a jacuzzi. <laughs> And I kind of followed him, but there was a wall, so I did a somersault over the wall, landed it funny and just went rolling. Woke up next day and I was in absolute agony. <laughs> I was I couldn't walk. So that's kind of how I did it. My being drunk with a dad acting like pissed up ninjas. I haven't danced for a long time. As soon as going to break dancing, I'm just feeling it so bad and it's worrying because a lot of our stuff is break dancing. I don't know if I'm gonna have to change a lot. Well, well, we'll see. I'm, I'm still open. If they're doing any dancing at all, it's just top of the foot and you're just getting paid. Keep doing your running, keep doing your gym work, otherwise you know you could cause damage that will keep you out of the show.